Hello, everybody. Good evening, and welcome back to the Grand Boulevard Coalition show. I'm your host, Cynthia Alvarez. It's been a while. I feel like it's been a while since the last time that we had been on here. So just a reminder of who I am and uh, what I do. I work for a program who that is a part of Chicago Area Project, and our program is called Healthy Living, Our Number One Goal. We do a lot of substance use prevention as well as HIV information uh, education and prevention. So, you know, talking to youth and adults about those topics, just trying to spread awareness on those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we get into the topic. Um, we have some events coming up uh, tomorrow, as some of you may know, is World AIDS Day. So my organization, Chicago Area Project, is going to be hosting a online workshop uh, for free. That uh, The information is found on the screen here. So it's an open dialogue meant for ages 14 to 21. Um, so it'll be between 5.30 to 7 p.m. And the meeting ID and passcode will be on the screen too. So that way you won't need the link for the Zoom. You can just take a picture of that meeting ID right there and you can just put it into Zoom and you should be able to get in from there. Um, but yeah, or otherwise, uh, find us, find our information on our social medias like Facebook at Chicago Area Project, and you can sign up through there. I will be hosting, co-hosting with one of my colleagues, uh, co-workers who uh, we have all put a lot of good work into this and just learning a lot about HIV AIDS, what that is, how it's contracted, um, the effects and things like that. So some of the things that I want to just uh, talk about uh, a little bit about HIV because I know I, I had done a session on this one earlier on a few uh, episodes ago. Um, we talked about HIV AIDS, but just a little bit of a rundown. If we can put that next flyer up that has HIV testing 101. So it's just some information on there um, that has some good stuff just relevant to uh, how to get tested, where to get tested. Um, so we can, you can kind of see that uh, flyer. It's shown, uh, made by the CDC. So it has some good information. Um, should you get tested for HIV? So we can kind of just, I can go through this with everyone just to kind of go over the, in case it may be hard for some people to read it. But um, just like it says here, uh, many HIV tests are quick and free and painless. You can also use an HIV self-test to learn your HIV status at home or in a private location. So there's lots of good places where you can get HIV test kits uh, for free uh, from organizations uh, like ours that promote uh, prevention, education related to HIV. And yeah, so there's lots of good places where everyone can get tested for it. That first kind of section, it said uh, everyone aged 13 to 64 should get tested for HIV at least once, and you should get tested at least once a year. If you are a man who has had sex with another man, if you have had sex with someone who has HIV, or are intimate with more than one partner. So another thing too that we kind of mentioned in those previous uh, shows is if you are if there are people in your life that have used needles who may have shared needles with other people uh, who use injection drugs that can be another risk factor for getting HIV. So that's how we recommend you know why we recommend people get tested um, for people who are engaging in those uh, behaviors. Um, just important for everyone to get tested. It's not saying you automatically have HIV, but just to know for yourself if you do have it or not, because like we've said before, it's something that is really not detectable right from just seeing somebody or just checking yourself. It's something that affects the autoimmune system. So just something to be aware of. It's not something that you can notice symptoms of right away. So it's important to get tested regularly or at least once a year. Um, for people who are just engaging in sexual activities or other things like that. Um, places where you can find out to get tested are like cdc.gov or finding info uh, through the Chicago Department of Public Health website. It has a lot of clinics where it gives out information like that. And yeah, so 
Something to do if your test result is positive is to schedule a follow-up test once you find out your HIV status, if it is positive, um, and look into treatment. So that can be preventative measures or taking stuff like PrEP, ART. Um, they've been looking into new medication for it as well, which is something that I recently learned about and we will talk about in our workshop tomorrow. So if you're interested, make sure you look into that. Um, but before we get into our uh, other topic, our main topic, well, I'm going to play a video on World AIDS Day. HIV continues to affect millions of people worldwide. Progress against HIV has been uneven and unequal. Even before COVID, important groups and populations were underserved. Children, adolescents, and other populations at high HIV risk are among those who are not being sufficiently reached by HIV testing, prevention, treatment, and care services, resulting in 4,100 new HIV infections every day. Did you know that 70% of new HIV infections are among key populations, men who have sex with men, sex workers, transgender people, people who inject drugs, people in prisons, and their partners? Only 52% of children living with HIV are on life-saving treatment, compared to 76% of adults. We have only eight years left to reach the 2030 goal of ending AIDS as a public health threat. That's why WHO is calling on global leaders and citizens to rally to confront the inequalities that drive AIDS and to ensure everyone everywhere has access to HIV services. This means Finding innovative ways to deliver person-centered HIV prevention, testing, treatment, and care services to everyone, irrespective of where they live or who people love. Doubling efforts to ensure all children living with HIV have access to testing and treatment, and all mothers have access to medicines to prevent or treat HIV before, during, and after pregnancy. Ensuring that all people at risk continue to obtain the services they need, Protecting, engaging, and supporting health workers to provide care that is kind, respectful of human rights, and without stigma or discrimination. To get this done in time, we need to renew and revitalize and accelerate the global fight to end AIDS by 2030. We have come so far, and we all must embrace the roles we have to play in equalizing the AIDS response. Right. Well, I hope that video was helpful for some of you learning about, just to learn a little bit more about AIDS and what that means, how it affects certain communities, and what we can do to hopefully improve that later, you know, as the years go on um, as a country. But yeah, getting into our main topic for today, um, I wanted to discuss hunger and homelessness. So earlier this month in November, I believe the week of the 13th, um, that whole week was Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. So just kind of wanting to talk about that topic as a whole, go into a little bit about like what does home, what is homelessness, what does that look like for different people, um, why it can happen, uh, why people can become homeless um, or houseless. Um, as well as just as well as other statistics related to what populations are experiencing it more, um, and just getting into a little discussion about that. So um, I guess going into it, we can talk about that first thing. So what is homelessness, right? Um, some of the information that I had gathered this from was from uh, the Coalition of Homelessness in Chicago, um, and so you can find information from that organization online and they even uh, had done a report on homelessness in Chicago specifically, um, which I feel like is really relevant for us to talk about. Um, as we know, it's, it's something that the whole country struggles with, but just to keep it relevant to our city and uh, the people that we're serving and that we're working with as well. So uh, what is homelessness? So it can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, people experience it differently, but for the most part, it's people who don't have a permanent home that they can go to and it can be people who are sleeping on the streets um, on trains even in their own vehicles people who have just lost their homes and just sleep in their vehicles cars and things like that um, as well as even couch surfing right that can also mean 
uh, homelessness as this is not a permanent house or housing situation for an individual. Um, so when someone does not have permanent shelter and a place to sleep uh, that they know that they can rely on and go back to, uh, that is considered homelessness. And so we can talk a little bit about why or what are some reasons that people can become homeless. And it is very different ranging from uh, things like generational poverty. We do talk a lot about or hear, or I'm sure you hear more about generational wealth and how that is passed down from people who make a lot of money, passing it down in their families. Generational poverty is something that can also be passed down to fam through families and from having kids and uh, kids who are raised in poverty um, may end up in that same cycle of poverty as well. Housing insecurity, food insecurity, it's all kind of interlinked with each other. Um, and it may be hard for some individuals to get out of that um, situation as well. So that's something that can be generational and can cause homelessness, as well as domestic violence partners leaving dangerous situations. Um, that can be something that can affect families, mothers who may be uh, pregnant or have children who need to leave a housing situation and their partner was the uh, financial person that made the most, that made the money in the household. And so if a parent leaves, a partner leaves, they may have to leave a situation where they might have to leave their home and go to a shelter. So that can cause homelessness as well as this person now is trying to find a new place to live that's safer for them and for their family or just for themselves. Um, and other situations such as um, youth as well. So <clears throat> there is a situation, there are, uh, there is a population of youth who are experiencing homelessness in Chicago and, of course, in other places where they have been kicked out of their homes by their parents or their caregivers for either, it may be political reasons, but that main reason that I want to talk about is uh, youth who come out to their families as a part of the LGBTQ plus community. So there is that stigma that parents just are not accept accepting of their children, whether it may be their, like I said, religious or political beliefs, and that can cause some issues with youth who are scared to come out to their parents. And if they do, um, some of the consequences are that their parents can kick them out or have kicked them out, um, and leaving these youth in dangerous situations on the streets, having to find shelter, going to shelters, um, and just putting them in more risky situations. So that is another one of the reasons uh, that youth become homeless, also adults, um, but mainly for youth, you know, who come out. And yeah, so going into a little bit of the statistics relating to Chicago in 2021, uh, there's an estimated 68,000, over 68,000 people who have been found to be experiencing homelessness. And this issue continues to rise. I believe in that um, report they had mentioned there's been an increase since then of about 7,000 more people. And I feel like COVID has definitely, you know, created situations where people have lost jobs and lost homes just because they weren't able to make ends meet. Um, and also renting situations too, where I believe they had a hold on uh, in certain states or in many states, I'm not exactly sure on the information, but where they were able to allow people to stay in their uh, homes that they were renting or apartments that they were renting for some time during COVID because people were not working or lost their jobs. Um, and now they're starting to implement it again where people need to start paying their rent again. And many people are still kind of trying to catch up um, from the aftermath of COVID. And yeah, so that's kind of some things that have caused more people to lose their homes and things like that. And um, so some key findings from the report done from the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless show that 82% of people experiencing homelessness are people of color. So Chicagoans identifying as Black, African American, Asian, Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaskan Native, and multiracial account for 55,000 of the people experiencing homelessness. So like that number I had mentioned earlier, it was about 68,000. 
So 55,000, that's like a huge majority of that population that's experiencing homelessness. Um, and they had also mentioned that, um, let's see here, Black and African American Chicagoans continue to disproportionately experience uh, homelessness. And they identified that um, only 12.6% of people experiencing homelessness are white. And our population is very, very diverse in Chicago. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of that disproportionate, right? So it's people of color mainly who have been experiencing homelessness due to racial inequalities um, and injustice due to just racism and other things like that that have been going on um, for a long time, for decades, for centuries. Um, and so centuries of racist economic, educational, and housing practices continue to leave Black Chicagoans more at risk of homelessness. Um, black and African American Chicagoans account for 53% of all people experiencing homelessness while making up only 29% of the city's population. So thinking about that number of 53% of people experiencing homelessness are Black or African American people, and they only account for 29% of the population. So that kind of shows you out of the millions of people that live in Chicago, how much it really does affect people of color. Um, like I said, due to racial inequalities and injustices um, that have been going on and have been implemented, whether it came, it came from racism and slavery from back before and not allowing people to take out loans for houses and also just kind of some other things historically that have gone on in Chicago, such as like transportation, cutoffs uh, from CTA. Um, that's, I feel like is a really interesting topic to get into, redlining and things like that that have happened in Chicago. Um, if you all wanna look up some videos on redlining, I highly suggest that. It was really enlightening for me to learn about when I was in college, just kind of seeing the, the way that uh, certain people who funded communities, certain communities uh, that were people of color, communities of color were funded less and had less resources, therefore less jobs, um, lots of food deserts and things like that. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was kind of going into like the homelessness, uh, hunger and the homelessness piece. Um, food insecurity is something, like I said, that goes hand in hand with homelessness and also in poor communities where people may have to travel really far to find a grocery store. And grocery stores may be too far for older people to travel to or people, you know, who don't have a car may have to take the bus. Uh, two buses, maybe even just to get to a grocery store. And that is something that I had seen as well in, you know, a project that I had to do for school, but also kind of living in that community as well. Um, I live in the West, uh, West Lawn area of Chicago. And just kind of taking that one bus route that's down 59th Street, you can really see that there is a lack of, um, uh, grocery stores, just like even grocery stores that have really uh, healthy foods, like a Whole Foods, things like that. Those stores are not really found in the South Side areas of Chicago. They're not as um, popular in those areas. We get more of like a food for less and that stuff um, may not have the most healthiest or even like the best uh, fruits and vegetables. And what you will see a lot more of is maybe fast food places. And fast food tends to be a lot cheaper even than buying healthy groceries like fruits and veggies. So people will tend to go for what is cheaper, right? Because that's something that's, it's more convenient. Like they can just pick it up on the way home. If they have kids that they had to cook for, um, it's just more convenient to get that um, fast food too. And that's something that I feel like is an issue as well um, as just making healthy food more affordable. Um, I believe they had another situation in Englewood in Chicago where they had put a Whole Foods in there and they ended up closing that one down. It might have been in a different neighborhood in Chicago, but they had opened a Whole Foods and ended up closing it down years later. So that just kind of shows you that they need to really see why people aren't able to even afford a Whole Foods in the first place because Whole Foods tends to be more expensive. Um, 
But yeah, so that's kind of going a little bit into that hunger piece and food insecurity, food deserts is really something that people need to learn about um, because you can kind of see the difference in other communities in the north sides of Chicago that have more resources, more uh, close by grocery stores, corner stores, stores that have healthy options versus like south side corner stores and other things like that. Um, but yeah, so another thing kind of talking about unaccompanied homeless youth um, experiencing homelessness are more likely to temporarily stay with others than to stay on the street or in shelters. So in 2021, 11,800 people experiencing homelessness were unaccompanied youth, so ages 24 and younger, 88% uh, of whom temporarily stayed with others, so maybe friends or uh, distant relatives, things like that. Um, in total, 3,100 unaccompanied youth and their children under 18 experienced homelessness. And most families experiencing homelessness are temporarily staying with others. In 2021, they found that 24,500 people in families with children were experiencing homelessness and 68% were temporarily staying with others. And they kind of mentioned some other statistics as well. Um, thinking about like the Hispanic and Latinx communities um, saying that they find that uh, they far, far more often experience homelessness by couch surfing. So they may have like distant, like I said, maybe people coming from other places, uh, traveling and finding a, trying to find a place to stay in Chicago, um, as well as just kind of thinking a little bit about what's going on with the Venezuelans as well, who have been migrating and that home, that recent, you know, homelessness crisis in itself, which is separate from Chicagoans who have been experiencing homelessness, but now that's something that is impacting Chicago as well and trying to find the resources for these people um, who need jobs, who have come, who don't know the language. So it's so many barriers that they're going through as well. Um, there's been a lot of pushback from communities just because of you know which populations deserve the resources more right you know it's like the Chicagoans who have been experiencing homelessness here for decades or people who have been recently coming um, to Venezuela from Venezuela and so just trying to find that line where everyone can try to find those resources for them for everyone right not just for a specific uh, population or another um, not to get too political or into anything, but it's, I feel like, right to say that everyone who has been experiencing homelessness in Chicago needs the resources. And it's definitely something that our city has been struggling with for a while. And that needs to be talked about more, I feel like. It's something that I've been learning about more. Um, even though our program doesn't necessarily focus on homelessness prevention, I feel like it's still something that's relevant because another thing that I didn't mention um, is that substance abuse can also potentially play a role in homelessness as well um, when substance abuse, you know, contributes to maybe job loss, right? So now they can't afford to pay rent for their apartment or their house. They end up losing that house um, and they're still, you know, addicted to the substance, whatever they may be using that could be taking up all of their financial resources. So that's another thing too. So I feel like it kind of all goes hand in hand. A lot of those issues are interlinked with each other. Um, and it's just important to talk about them and raise that awareness with families, with youth, um, making sure they're finding the right resources for them, whether that be WIC or other um, welfare, social welfare resources, making sure that we prevent more homelessness is really important. So just spreading that awareness. but. Yeah, that's kind of a little bit about hunger and homelessness. I hope you learned a little something. I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to watch my episode today and look, in, look forward to next week where we will be having a uh, intern that will be interviewed. So I hope you all have a good rest of your evening and we will talk soon. Thank you. Bye.